welcome on this new moon, this February Black History and Futures Month, this 58th anniversary day of the assassination of Al Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X. And as Janine will share, Losar, the Tibetan New Year. Welcome to Naropa's extended campus conversation with Dr. Janine Kanti on her recently published 2022 book, Returning the Self to Nature, Undoing Our Collective Narcissism and Healing Our Planet. I'm Jason Apt, faculty in Naropa's online psychology program and honored to serve as host and conversation partner with Janine, my longtime colleague and friend. Janine is a professor in the Transformative Studies doctoral program at the California Institute of Integral Studies, where she telecommutes from a distance via her home in the foothills of Boulder. Janine was previously professor of environmental studies at Naropa and core faculty at Prescott College she still guest teaches at Naropa Prescott and also Pacifica Graduate Institute. She has a doctorate in transformative learning and change, a master's in cultural eco-psychology and a bachelor's in international relations. She's a nationally and internationally sought out speaker, regularly sits on panels and dialogue with other leading cultural thinkers and workers. In addition to this new book, she is editor of and contributor to two other recent books, and author of numerous articles and book chapters. This book, Returning the Self to Nature, is the first sustained attempt to see narcissism through the lens of eco-psychology. In some of my own words, Janine is an intuitive, cultural, and psychological seer who is a leading scholar-activist, scholar -activist, force in environmental climate and social justice movements, environmental science, deep ecology, eco-philosophy, eco-feminism, permaculture, wilderness therapy, and its related recovery movements, addiction work, work and African-American leadership in the wider, whiter American Buddhist movement. We should be reminded of the importance of Janine's work at a time such as this, the proto-fascist draconian new McCarthyism of book bans. I come from a people of book burns who knows these signs well. Attempts to silence and punish educators and educational institutions, interrupt DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion work, anti-woke attacks on black theory and black intellectuals engaged in consciousness raising about systemic, structural, and institutional racism through, among other analytic tools, intersectionality and critical race theory. I see Janine's work located in the black radical tradition with her internationalist critique of capitalism, colonial racism, Euro modernity's expropriation and exploitation of land, resources, and human bodies, labor. Her phenomenon, sociogeny, the understanding that individual psychological and behavioral problems are, are societally caused. And Janine's is a progressive Black radicalism, free of sexist and heteronormative homo and transphobias, identity essentialisms or ideas of racial purity, and anti-universalist separatism. Janine's brand of universalism is like Cesar's, quote, universal rich with all that is particular, end quote. I hope Janine's book will be added to the esteemed banned books list of liberatory resources. So we have 90 minutes and we encourage you to write uh, questions that arise for you throughout in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen and we will turn our attention to hear Janine's responses to the questions in the latter third of the evening. So let's orient ourselves in land, culture, body. Where are you? What happened there? What's happening there?
I'm currently settled in the southeastern peninsula of Turtle Island on the Atlantic seaboard, aka La Florida, ancestral home of the Pajeoki grassy waters or Everglades, the mangroves, the Muskoki and Mikusuki speaking peoples, Yuhi, Yamasi, Tequesta, Abalachi, and others later to be called by the Spanish colonial invaders, Cimarrones for runaway or wild animals, natives who fled or resisted or lived outside Spanish mission control. And later for the English colonists became Seminoles, today's Seminoles, and Creeks and Miccosukee and Choctaws and Chickasaws and Muscogee and Calusa and Tocobaga and others, including Black Indians and Black Seminoles and Maroons related to that word Cimarron runaways, Africans living outside colonial control or enslavement in maroon towns or with native tribes. Janine, will you tell us where you are and also let us know about Losar? Well, th thank you, Jason, uh, for that introduction as well. I'm gonna have to Google some of the words you used <laughs> later. Um, but yeah, and I love that we're starting off with acknowledging the lands that we live upon. And I live upon the ancestral lands of the Ute Arapaho and Cheyenne First Nation peoples. And I'm outside in the foothills of Boulder, Colorado, in between two canyons. And uh, yeah, and I live among a host of wild animals, including uh, bears and foxes and deers and mountain lions and uh, ravens and crows and magpies and stellar jays and just um, we've got creeks and just um, so many um, present beings and of course some wild human neighbors as well and yeah I think um, there's many people here within the Naropa community and probably some um, that may be less familiar and at Naropa one of the um, major holidays of the year uh, that we celebrate through Tibetan Buddhist traditions is Losar. And there were celebrations today, and it's really just the um, new year. People often, I think, say cheerful new year or happy Losar. And each year shifts into another um, kind of archetype. And this year is the year of the water rabbit. And so I have actually been seeing lots of water or lots of water in Boulder lately with all the snows, but lots of rabbits just reminding me of what this year is supposed to be. And I do just want to make a little note about cultural appropriation because as um, Jason noted, um, well, Naropa and many institutions are predominantly white institutions, yet we're really diverse and we're um, very informed and founded by a Tibetan Buddhist. And so just acknowledging that um, some of these traditions, especially the New Year and Buddhism in general is a tradition that is open in these types of aspects and actually hoping people will choose to celebrate. And so with uh, the water rabbit year, it's a yin year, so very feminine. And last year was also a um, water year, but it was a very turbulent year of the water tiger. And I'm really glad to be uh, through with that year. And so this year is um, really supposed to invoke a lot of gentleness, rest, uh, stillness, yet at the same time, we need to be ready to be alert and to move quickly when needed. Um, but I'm really hoping for calm and quiet and that gentleness. But I also acknowledge that in kind of our current um, um, post-normal reality, these turbulent times, um, we don't actually need to expect this to be the archetype. We actually need to create it. And being in a practice community like Naropa, um, we need to double down on that type of warriorship. And the water rabbit is also called a black rabbit because the dark water. And so it's also entering a year of deep mystery. And I'm reminded of that white rabbit um, from Alice in Wonderland and uh, kind of going down the rabbit hole into deep mystery. So thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Let's uh, return ourselves to the nature of the deep feminine mystery and bow together in Naropa's tradition. Janine, in your book, you include a number of guided experiential exercises. Will you ground us further and give us a taste of one of those to begin? Sure, sure. And uh, yeah, this one's uh, just really simple and something that probably many um, folks that are here have uh, done. And I'm assuming, well, just if you're sitting on a chair, or whether you're on the floor, or even if you're standing, just allow your body to be heavy and really feel the weight of your body on the chair or your cushion or the floor. Uh, hopefully get your feet on the floor so you feel grounded. And uh, you can make your eyes soft, not staring at anything. And you can even close your eyes if that feels comfortable. And let that heaviness of your body really permeate your legs and your sit bones, your feet, your arms. Just be supported by the ground below you. And then start your breathing deep in your belly. You can even put your hand on your belly. Just start deep breathing and then going back to your sit bones, your seat, imagine that you have deep roots forming at the base of your sit bones that plunge deep into the earth, at least about six feet down. And it doesn't matter if you're um, three stories up um, or there's cement and basements below you, just know that those roots are plunging through whatever barriers and making gentle contact with the ground below you. And let your roots expand widely and feel that sustenance of earth. And keep that deep breathing in your belly feeling some heat generating and let your inhales and your exhales be deep, taking in cleansing air. And then notice your posture and let it be upright, but not too taut, not too stiff. And notice your neck and Elongate that and slightly tuck your chin. Relax your mouth and jaw. You can even stretch your mouth out and stick out your tongue. Relaxing your face. And relaxing your eyes. And then imagine just as you have those roots below you, imagine that you have um, beautiful branches that are sprouting out of your crown, reaching towards the sky above you. And being rooted and grounded and branching. Just notice once more your body and notice if there's any pain or discomfort in any places and take a deep breath, sending that energy to all of those spaces. And then touch into your heart and just notice any one emotion that just surfaces for you. And don't spend time thinking about it, just whatever surfaces. And just let that be one of many emotions you're experiencing. And so we'll just sit in silence, breathing for another moment.
being here, being connected. And then as you feel ready, um, come back into our Zoom space. From the preface, you write, the heat and drought too often present in the Western United States, caught up to the community I live in, in the foothills of Boulder, Colorado, marked by high dry grasses, stifling heat and pending fears of wildfires. I've lived out West for almost three decades and have become accustomed to the dryness of midsummer and the eventual coming of the rains, yet for several summers, this pattern is broken with the rain sometimes forsaking us and the late summer and fall bringing treacherous fires. Perhaps most discouraging, the beautiful mountain air has been replaced with daily ozone warnings to stay indoors. The current pairings of fires, floods, pandemics, climate refugees, homelessness, poverty, fossil fuel pollution, and unbridled inequities and then I'm gonna bracket and insert something for right where we are now. The doomsday clock, this metaphoric clock that is updated annually by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which warns the public how close we are to destroying our world, our vulnerability uh, to anthropogenic human caused global catastrophe, catastrophe from nuclear war, climate change, where midnight on the clock represents apocalypse. Just on January 24th, last month, they moved the hands of the clock forward to 90 seconds, one and a half minutes to midnight, the closest it's ever been since the clock was created in 1947. And so all these psycho, social, ecological, which Janine shows the connection between the psychological, social and ecological, all these problems, and now back to your words, often make us feel that earth has finally forsaken us. She has decided to finally leave the abusive relationship she has been in with us for decades or even centuries. And then you say the seeds of this inquiry for this book were planted from a difficult romantic relationship I had with a narcissist. And in looking at individual narcissism, I noticed how it mirrored the collective narcissism that we're engaging in and the damage it's inflicting on the earth. And seeing narcissism as, as an individual problem is itself a problem, you said. Psychology itself may be narcissistic to the extent that it keeps us focused on our smaller selves rather than on the greater good. So will you tell us, Janine, more about the seeds of this inquiry and this, this metaphor you're making of an individual relationship to the collective, this earth parent, this corporate parent, and this abusiveness and how this, there's a mirror between this micro and macro in your expanded worldview, systems view. Yeah, and you may have to <laughs> remind me of some of those uh, dimensions because that's a lot right there. Yeah, but in um, very simple, um, I always, I'm the type of academic that I'll have an experience and then um, usually I'll have some sort of like, whoa, uh, a disorienting dilemma about it. And I'll need to find out all I can in order to um, work with my shock and my worldview. And so, as you mentioned, I had a um, relationship, a short-lived relationship, maybe just six months with someone who could potentially be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder or extreme narcissism, but I am not a licensed um, counselor or therapist and even folks that are um, licensed, it's really hard to diagnose a individual narcissist. And so the book's really not about individual narcissism, but in that experience, it was so shocking to um, be in relationship to someone who was so self-centered and really um, just blocked out the feedback from pretty much the rest of the world on their own behaviors and really um, structured their world to fit 
their own needs and views. And so after that, I did a lot of research, but there was something just really tender in it for me. Because when you look at whether it's um, scholarly articles and books or pop psychology or you know blogs from people who are the victims of narcissists, uh, it's constant kind of demonizing of someone who has narcissistic personality disorder or who has extreme narcissism. And, um, you know, it's sad because, well, there's two reasons. First, one that I thought of is that when you, a lot of therapists say that you should just shun a narcissist and get them out of your life. And that means that you're basically just recycling them onto the general population. And so someone else is going to have that same bad experience. But even deeper is when you look at the research on narcissistic personality disorder, the disorder comes from um, trauma in early childhood that they uh, exhibit in object relations theories, one of two unhealthy patterns. Either they had a um, parent who put so much uh, attention on their own needs, the parents' needs, and had the child be hypervigilant of having to attend to their needs, or the parent um, just re withdrew affection and intent attending to the child, mirroring proper behavior. And e e either of those pa patterns result in damaged trust. And so you have this wounded being from a very early age that in order to create a bearable world, they can construct uh, like a cocoon of safety where they're the center stage, every day is their birthday, um, where they're extremely exceptional and special. And so there's certain patterns and traits of a narcissist. And so you have someone that's um, very arrogant, um, all about ego. And uh, there's a scholar, Craig Malkin, that another narcissist, um, narcissist specialist that will talk about a narcissistic scale or spectrum. And all of us, uh, to some degree, are have some level of narcissism, and we should we should have healthy egos, but we want to be, if the scale is one to 10, we want to be somewhere on the five. And when we uh, are too low, it's too low um, and too high is obviously way too high. And then what happens with those um, patterns is I remember that my main area of teaching is eco-psychology, as you mentioned, and eco-psychology really looks at how people, and particularly people of Western civilization, and anyone who's really under a global corporate paradigm, has disconnected our identities from the natural world. And uh, it's a beautiful area of um, study and more important in terms of practice and creating change in the world to address all the things that you were talking about. But I had remembered that a few of the very early eco-psychologists wrote a lot about the um, relationship between narcissism and um, consumerism, our addictions to buying things, and not so much of the American dream. And so I started looking at this um, idea that collectively uh, people in the US and really anyone in kind of a Western um, globalized corporate um, paradigm, but particularly in the US and I'm very US centric uh, that we're collectively narcissists and we're being um, accrued to be that way. And why wouldn't we be? Um, we're basically, um, our society is always trying to boost its gross domestic product and we are the um, consumers. And so the more insecure we feel about the way we look and our status and so many different things, the more we purchase things. And so we see the society where all of us are living these individual stories, we're doing social media, um, there's just so much kind of overblown sense of self-importance. And we have this um, 
underneath of all this really deep wounded because we've lost our connection to our earth-based traditions and what like the real sense of self is our real core and there's so many dimensions in that but um, a short piece that I think addresses what you were asking with that too when I wrote the book I realized that with this collective meme of narcissism, and if we go back to the individual narcissists and that wounded pattern of um, having the caregivers not attend to their needs, as a collective in our society, we're all wounded because originally in our earth-based traditions, we would we know that earth is our mother, that um, our truest mother is Mother Earth. Um, you know, no matter actually what your tradition is, we in some ways need to acknowledge that we live um, within the body of Earth and we're nothing without um, being within Earth. Um, we're connected to the air and the water and sunlight um, to all um, beings and it's all interrelated. There's really no individual um, self, but we've had such a bounded uh, conscription to believe this. And so with breaking our relationship with our truest mother, we've supplanted it with a new parent, which I would say is corporate globalization. And so now we give allegiance to this false reality, which has created this false cocoon. So that's a real um, kind of short synapse of um, some of what's uh, in the book. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. So I'll, I'll read a piece from what you say about this, about these two patterns from this early childhood trauma um, or the, either the lack of attention or the, early, the withdrawal of attention too soon, which as you said, is the cutting off or the separation disconnection from nature. You say being cut off from our relationship with earth as we often are in our current society runs parallel to the pattern of attention withdrawn too early. And most children do not have a sufficient relationship with nature. Young children typically spend very little time outside in wild places. And then you, you discuss this nature deficit disorder. And the other pattern, attention de demanding excessive needs from the parent, as you were just saying, this corporate uh, uh, parent, if you wanna say, uh, but also you speak about it as the, the, the earth who's hurt she then becomes damaged she be then comes demanding as well yeah so in we're sense getting this demands from the corporate parent and from the earth mother who is needing now extra attention um, from the damage that's being done yeah okay so um You make, I think, a really insightful connection between narcissism and whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you to, to explain that connection. And, but first, I wanted to say that you qualify it by saying that when you relate whiteness to narcissism, you don't mean to correlate it to all white people, but being narcissists, but to, to highlight that the system of whiteness, wherein becoming and identifying as white, parallels our collective narcissism. And including the ways that, so can you talk about this connection between narcissism and whiteness, including white privilege and fragility that you? Sure. Ooh, you're getting into heavy stuff right away. <laughs> sure. And um, maybe I can, uh, it'd probably be helpful just to give a little uh, kind of more of an overview of the patterns of um, narcissism. And I think I mentioned them, but just so we have a little kind of grounded understanding of it, the traits of an individual narcissist, uh, you have a grandiose sense of self, just this extreme arrogance, um, like I'm just so, so important. Um, and then it's coupled with really low empathy for other people. And I always like to give the example of, um, Everyone has that um, person in their life that maybe you go to tea with them or you're talking on the phone and um, they ask you, but you start talking a little bit about how you're doing. And once you've said maybe a minute, they 
immediately redirect and just start talking about themselves. And for the rest of the conversation, uh, you can't get a word in. Um, it's the person who will usually talk over you, not ask you many questions. And then if you do have some real issues, they may not be available at all. And then uh, this shamelessness, a narcissist has this feeling that they can just um, do no wrong. It's uh, um, um, if there's a problem, the problem is with someone else and someone else is always to blame. And then oddly enough, another trait is a really fragile ego. And that's that wounding we talked, I spoke about before, this deep rooted insecurity, which um, relates to this then the other way of this overblown arrogance. And then um, another piece a trait is a hypersensitivity to critique. Often if you give a narcissist negative feedback, they will freak out. And if you do it strongly enough, they will often cut you out of their life for a time, if not forever. And then as I uh, said earlier, a narcissist has this constant need to feel more special than others. Because um, of course we're all unique and special, but they need to be in a hierarchy where they're better looking, more successful, fitter, um, smarter. Um, they have more toys, more status. And so when we relate this to uh, whiteness and uh, in the book, I uh, had a quote from uh, Snow White of that archetype of the evil queen, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all, um, I think in that section. And um, that wasn't really about race, but just that fairer piece and how that is actually part of the collective Western um, meme of that fairer skin. And I really looked at that Western kind of white paradigm. And Jason, I love that you put out there that um, I'm not talking about white people in, in general, but the system of white supremacy. And that was really created to separate um, diverse groupings at the onset of um, our colonized country. And so at a certain point of time in the um, 1700s, there were um, different rebellions going on in different areas in the Americas. And so the owning white class realized that if the um, all the various um, First Nations people, um, both free and enslaved black peoples, and also um, poor and working class white people got together in solidarity, they would actually outnumber the uh, white owning class. And so hence whiteness was actually created. Before that people were you know, English or Irish or German um, and all of these different um, statuses and there wasn't equality among um, white people. And of course there isn't now, uh, but whiteness became a past to have all of these uh, types of privileges. And the way that whiteness has been um, presented in that archetype is of that fierce individualism. Like you get yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, if you really work hard and climb the ladder, you've really um, uh, made yourself and you've done it in a way that no one else can. And this ideal of competition with one another and also the extraction of resources from the earth to um, make a profit in terms of um, Western economics. And then this idea of just constant like specialness, um, privilege, entitlement, exceptionalism. And it even showed up in really faulty science with um, theories of eugenics and all sorts of things. And so that's not to say that um, white people um, pair nicely with narcissism, because as 
um, this meme of collective narcissism has rolled out. There's also research that lots of people of color um, exhibit even higher level of narcissism in terms of feeling that deep insecurity and then um, overcompensating with trying to buy all of these goods and have these different types of statuses and um, look at a certain type of standard. And so um, it can be... Uh, affect anyone, but the paradigm of white supremacy and narcissism is definitely there. Thank you. Um, maybe um, this was this was a really powerful insight for me, the connection you made between hyper individualism, which you spoke just now about in terms of being one of the features individualism of this larger system, corporate, um, transnational, uh, uh, corporate globalization and, uh, you know, you, you name it as many other things, materialism, consumerism, um, capitalism, et cetera. But what, what specifically the hyper individualism, this connection you make between uh, individualism in, in, in the sense of focus on the self, focus on the individual and the connection you make with that, obviously with narcissism and, and this issue of divide and conquer solidarities you know, with, with natives, with, with African descended peoples, with the poor, the poor whites, indentured servants, et cetera, that there's this, this, I think that this was something really key, this connection you make, I think is, is really, really important about that there's something going on here between whiteness, narc collective narcissism and hyper individualism is part of the divide and conquer strategy of breaking solidarities apart. Um, <laughs> like, yep. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I want to just add a few more things that you also list in addition to what you said, because I think it's be really helpful, hopefully, for all of us to think about whiteness in this lens. These are, again, as Janine is saying, clinical, what are considered in psychology and psychiatry, clinical features or traits of individual narcissism and how we can think these also towards uh, the system or of white supremacy or whiteness feigning interest uh, uh, because of wanting something from someone else and using people but then dropping them when they're not needed for oneself um, being irritated when as Janine said hearing others talk about themselves it becomes irritating and then when that turning back onto the self but also we, in white critical white studies etc gets talked about as recentering whiteness and only allowing in to come in what reinforces one's own worldview, um, which creates, Janine writes, how it creates a false reality and a false self, or like a fantasy world that's where the self is the central, which you spoke some, and always needing to be right, becoming combative, volatile, explosive with emotions, difficulty regulating emotions, feeling attacked, and um, becoming aggressive when feeling threatened, uh, and um, not admitting vulnerability and not wanting people to know when one is upset, except being be feeling fine to be open about when one is getting attacked, upset about getting attacked. So, yeah. So I think this is a really this is a really uh, important part um, amongst many in your book. So, yeah, and it's it's so interesting. Like when you when I'm listening again to those, um, it's like, well, yeah, that person sounds like a real jerk, right? Um, and then when we relate it to collective society and how um, this fierce individualism and this sense that we need to be someone and someone really important and also these identities that we're given um, that really always are the story of kind of becoming and achieving and making some sort of um, fame or stake of higher intelligence or a lot of money. And we see this as an, an individual pursuit. And we forget that in our um, original origins, we come from communities of people. I mean, I know not everyone here forgets and many of us are um, in practice and relationship with really deep, whether they're spiritual or cultural or just our chosen families, earth-based um, um, connections. But when in those 
it's a way of recognizing our um, interdependency with one another. And it doesn't really matter um, who we are because we're always included as part of the group. And even with, that was a point I wanted to talk about earlier, which um, I forgot is that any sort of disorder, um, so many of my teachers and um, wisdom holders see any disorder as in, a, in an individual is actually about the community. And so we need to stop um, um, blaming individuals or um, just looking at um, a diagnosis as to an individual and looking at what does this mean about the collective. And I think with that Western um, paradigm, we often identify our self with just our kind of thinking minds or like our big bobble heads and um, our egos uh, tend to reside there. And we're constantly in that kind of thinking, not only the thinking mode, but also what you were talking about, that things can easily become transactional of, um, you know, what does this mean to me? Um, you know, what what is this person? How are they going to help me? What can I get from them? Um, rather than looking at our relational field and being able to open up that way. And so many of us, even though I know most of us here are probably in practice communities or, and meditators, but maybe we spend you know, 20 to 40 minutes a day trying to drop our thinking minds and our egos, yet as soon as we're done, it's so easy to bring it back. And uh, I think we've done so much damage in shaming our egos instead of um, I've been doing a practice lately of um, apologizing to my ego for using it so much and letting it know it's okay to rest most of the time and just only bring up my ego. I mean, I don't really do this, but trying to only bring up my ego when I need some sort of rational organizing <laughs> um, skill set. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so that this is probably a good time, and as you've already started to turn towards, uh, as your mentor Belvi would say, what does healing look like? And this we we could take this into our this last part before we open to questions. Um, and you talk about a number of things that you could um, share of uh, Joanna Macy's work on the work that reconnects the great unraveling. You say something so beautiful about grief and grief work. You say the very act of acquiescing to grief with its loss of personal control is a step toward a less self-centered way of being. You talk about you do worldview expansion work, recentering relationships, the ecological capital S self uh, in place of the false self, the Winnicottian false self. The uh, And of course, you won't speak to all these, but I want to just lay some out. The, this calling, the daimon or the daimon, the spirit guide, and, and, and tr grace, trust, and the greater, the more, the transpersonal. So will you just share some with us? And um, I know you're careful to say that you're, you're not naive about healing. You don't think it's a, a cookbook. You know it's a <laughs> lifelong relationship. And, uh, but what does healing look like? And also the original instructions from the ancestors. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah, that's a that's a lot right there. And you can pick. Really, yeah. Um gosh. Yeah, and it, you hit it on the um hit, hit it on the pin on the head with there's really no um cookbook, no pattern, no perfect recipe for healing because it's all gonna be a um bricolage of different pieces that are different for each of us. So I just kind of laid out um, the things from my teaching and my work and my own process that um, are really important um, and obviously steeped in um, so many wisdom traditions and um, you know actual research of um, different processes. And so I think, uh, gosh, well, I'll, I'll talk about a number of them. And you mentioned that unraveling, uh, that Joanna Macy uses that term a lot, and really just, just waking up 
waking up to the fact that we're in an ecological crisis, uh, we're in a social justice crisis, they're totally connected. We're living in a world that is in extreme stress. Um, Jason, you were talking about how the earth has kind of given up on us in a way, and we can look in uh, communities across the globe and there's just issue after issue, whether it's with the human populations that live there, the other um, animal populations and humans are animals as well, uh, despeciations, the water pollution, um, uh, just the, the fire, we, we, you named them all at the beginning or so many of them, um, but we're also looking at the toxicity from the mining and oil spills and um, nuclear waste, and it can go on and on, but um, it's everywhere, yet we're still kind of trying to um, gently and um, overtly wake people up that this is something um, pretty serious. It's not something that's just going to, um, it's not just trending, it's it's um, the biggest challenge of uh of our lives, of earth, earth life. Um, and so we need to wake up because unless we hit rock bottom and have acceptance that this is going on, we're not going to do anything about it. And you talked about that grief work. And there's so many folks from Joanna Macy to Miriam Greems band to uh, Pema Chodron that are really turning to um, the work of attending to our emotions. And there's so many folks, uh, but it, unless we really feel what's going on, um, often we can intellectually take in the uh, statistics of the ecological and social justice crisis and be like, yeah, I understand it. But if we don't feel it, we're not gonna radically change our lifestyles and also the way that we relate with all sentient beings. And so there, there's so much there. Uh, some of the other pieces I talked about, um, kind of loving ourselves and mindfulness. And um, those are things that uh, Naropa does so well of, of actually developing deep compassion for our own selves. So much of us, so many of us are. Um, really just constantly critiquing ourselves, our bodies, our um, skillfulness, and how are we going to um, spread love and healing across the planet if we can't even show up for ourselves and love ourselves and develop our own healthy egos and the gifts. We all come into this world with some sort of gift and calling to share. And, you know, it's not about being like a banker or, a you know, all these jobs that um, are not our true gifts. And unless we find that ground of being of ourselves, we're not going to be able to have that offering. And we could talk, well, we could talk all day about mindfulness and we could try to practice it as well. A huge um, piece in both eco psychology and deep ecology is developing our ecological selves. And this related to. Um, Jason mentioned uh, the work of um, uh, those that speak about nature deficit disorder and um, really looking at how do we actually connect deeply with our ecological selves. And that's where we learn to move beyond our ego, our small selves and start identifying whether it's with the night stars or a tree that's outside or um, birds around us or a body, a river that we live near or um, the mountains that we see all the time, whatever it is, we start to realize that our wellness and their wellness are bound together. And we actually start feeling love. And so we extend ourselves. And there's other practices that in a lot of my work um, we talk about moving from the ecological self as well as a multicultural self where we actually learn how to embrace lots of different, um, step into other people's shoes from lots of different um, positionalities, whether it's around um, gender, race, um, sexuality, um, varying abilities, um, different, yeah, just 
all of these different social locations, as we learn stories of folks, we actually open our hearts and um, start to develop, you know, little bits of understanding um, and love for people who are different from us. And so we start noticing that we become expanded and different as well. So we've got the ecological self, the multicultural self, and then um, in so many of our fields that we have at Naropa and related schools, we talk about transpersonal self or self. And one of the um, biggest pieces, um, kind of ahas for me in doing this work in this book was just the idea of grace and how um, folks that are extreme narcissism, they've created these really um, rigid boundaries, these cocoons where they have to keep everything intact um, and always have to um, believe their reality or else it will crumble. So they can't let in any data that will put a crack in it because then their whole world will fall apart. And so really um, a sad part of that, a real tragedy is that that also applies to letting in any um, kind of spirituality or grace whatever you may call, whether you say the Buddha or God or goddess or mother earth or nature or um, whatever terms you might attribute to what makes you say, wow, there is something much bigger than me and much bigger than the human intelligence. And it uh, filters in through so many different um, sense perceptions that are often not spoken about, whether it's the dream world, whether it's in our visual perceptions, whether it's our instincts, um, our intuition, um, synchronicities, uh, that when we're cut off from that, we're actually cut off from the juice of life and that um, collective consciousness and the magic of the world that um, really keeps us um, all as divine beings. And I think that's uh, what's been coming up with me so deeply lately. I've been, there's one um, section that I wrote for this book that's not in the book. It was just getting a little too academic and I um, published it in a chapter in a very academic book, but I've been dipping back to it a lot lately and kind of distilling it. And um, I, I tend to be more, I think a simplistic person and just uh, wanting to distill it in that. And uh, it's about this idea of primary narcissism and just uh, how Theodore Rozak, one of the, the founder of eco-psychology uh, in one of his kind of ending works talked about um, this idea that maybe narcissism and some other folks is actually has a positive um, benefit. And if we think about it as um, bringing us kind of back to the um, garden that we um, left on um, that metaphor, but really back to our earth-based traditions of um, being in uh, kind of sensual wonder, kind of going back into that magic of the womb and being held back into mother earth and but in the present we have these identities that were um, we've kind of um, become such complex beings with these really high levels of um, in some ways self-awareness and different types of skillfulness where we don't feel as community collected and um, maybe more of a homogenized way of like being a part of a very earth-based tradition or different things. Yet we all have these like brilliance, um, this brilliant bits shining with us. And we just really want to show them um, to other people, but it's so hard to express it. Um, and so kind of going back, I do a lot of yoga. And uh, if you've ever a classic yoga class, the teacher will say, uh, what well, I think the saying is, um, I bow to the, the light of you, the light within me bows to the light within you. And so um, it's, people say it so many times that you're like, uh-huh, 
Uh, but if you actually think about just this kind of divine spark that's within each of us, and when we can actually let our ego um, go and let um, kind of grace or whatever you may call it back in, that um, spark really brightens again. And so we could have um, an orientation where we're seeing that sparkiness with every being because every being has it. Um, and yeah, so uh, I think that's a perfect maybe um, spot to end mm. on that on that part. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll open it up to questions now. Um, and, um, okay, so I'm working with, I'm working on a paper, this is anonymous, uh, about the embodiment of nonviolence as resistance against capitalism. Where nonviolent, where does nonviolent philosophy fit into this conversation? Hmm. Oh, gosh, that's a, uh, Maybe we can sit with that for a moment. So will you read that again? So where does nonviolence, nonviolent um, uh, philosophy yes. fit? So they're working on a paper on embodiment of nonviolence as resistance against capitalism. Mm -hmm. And they want to know where does nonviolent philosophy fit into this conversation? Yeah, maybe we can, let's talk it out a little bit because I'm <laughs> not sure if those, uh, of course it fits. And there's a few things that come up for me. First is kind of the violence that is at the root of the disconnection for both the um, you know, child that ends up becoming a narcissist um, and not being cared for by their primary caregivers. But I also think about the um, violence that happens to rip earth-based peoples from the land throughout the um, 500 and more years of colonization. And that's a, I mean, a big thing that we haven't really even talked about um, in eco-psychology. A lot of the scholars will go back to that point of when did we disconnect from earth and really looking at um, when we were ripped from the land and then all of the um, things that happened. Uh, Chalice Glendening, uh, anyone who's taken a class with me is probably rolling their eyes right now, but has my um, all time, one of my all time favorite books called My Name is Chalice and I'm in Recovery from Western Civilization. And she really brings up this idea of the original trauma. Like, when did we separate? And it's a whole host of different things, but it was incredibly violent and it created these um, cycles after cycles of violence that le le leads to 500 years of violence that leads to the present day and is still happening. And so when we think about nonviolence and the tradition of nonviolence, well, and I, you know, it, it is, it is Black History Month, <laughs> but I think about Martin Luther King and all of the um, folks um, um, that took did boycotts and so many different actions and are still doing those things and how nonviolence was at the center of it, but it wasn't nonviolence in terms of being peaceful, but it was in not cooperating um, of really doing a revolutionary action of not cooperating and informing. Um, and so I think there's something really important about that um, I'm trying to think too, just in terms of, um, Jason could probably, um, chime in with pieces about, um, Gandhi and principles of nonviolence. I know the founder of deep ecology, Arnie Ness, was really informed by a lot of principles of nonviolence and really looking at the, um, how we can hold the sentience of all, the wellness of all sentient beings at the um, platforms of all of our actions. And so, yeah, and so this was nonviolence in terms of economic systems as well. They were saying against resistance against capitalism as embodied okay. resistance against capitalism. Yeah, um, that's interesting because I'm teaching a deep ecology 
class right now for um, Naropa students and we are we just had a conversation about this all last week and I think so much of it is about dis di divestment of not participating in what Joanna Macy and David Corton would call business as usual and so we're obviously all nested within a um, corporate capitalistic system, but we can find as many leverage points to divest from it. So again, kind of like the narcissist holding that strict worldview, if we think of capitalism as that strict worldview, but if we start creating cracks in terms of um, supporting um, industries and local people um, that we want to put our fundings in, shifting to things like the gift economy, um, radically reducing what we actually, um, you know, spend money on. So we're not actually just um, being consumers all the time and finding all of the different ways that we can divest from it. So again, it would be um, kind of holding actions in defense of the earth as Joanna Macy would talk about. Yeah, and someone I just noticed, uh, Julia wrote that I rest is resistance, and it reminds me of what you what you brought from Audre Lorde about it's a yes. radical political act to self care. It's not self indulgent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If we did all of these kind of um, wellness practices, including spending time on the earth, including taking care of other beings and places, and taking care of ourselves, and um, you know all of those things that actually require no um, money. Uh, and when we're doing these things, we're actually not putting out um, um, economics as well. So, well, economics, but we're not putting out cash for these. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and I'll just say briefly, and we'll go to the next question that I think another aspect of nonviolence in this is that fundamentally the systems view or systems perspective that Janine takes from deep ecology and eco-psychology is itself fundamentally nonviolent because it spreads out uh, any kind of like causal accountabilities. It, it always wants to look at on a systems level instead of uh, reducing things to an individual. So in this case, the individual narcissist and she's Janine's taking a what many indigenous communities as she said, the view that when something's going on for an individual, it's to look instead at what's going on in the community. And that, that's a fundamentally a, a nonviolent move to uh, to remove that self blame or that victim blaming and uh, have more accountability. Uh, it's a basic idea in family therapy. It's called the identified patient, the IP. Families go in and they've got the one child who's symptomatic and a good family therapist will say, will start to spread it out and say, well, everyone needs to look at themselves. This, this uh, child is symptomatic, but it's actually symptomatic of energetic, emotional dy dynamics that are happening within the system, not necessarily just within one individual. So next we have, what led you to, what led is a big one, but what led you to <laughs> eco-psychology? How did you start your journey? Um, yeah. That's yeah. A, yeah, that's a great question. Um, Gosh, yeah, that's a, yeah, it is a, kind of a long, long journey. I was, I don't even know where to start. I was, um, I was born in the, in the Bronx. <laughs> I was born in New York City. And, um, but I, as before I was even one years old, I was moved to the, my parents uh, decided to integrate an all white community in the suburbs of New Jersey. And so, um, in my childhood, my early childhood, talk about early childhood wounding, I and my brother experienced so much racism. And so I always, um, you know, I always kind of felt that, uh, you know, basically people are good, good deep inside, but they are all, there was something very wrong with them. So I always was wondering like, what is wrong with people? And so, and I actually was really into the theater. Like um, I was into dance and acting and singing um, throughout my childhood, through my teenage years. And one year I was doing a performance um, in Summerstock 
and um, all the parts we were doing children's productions were like Cinderella and Snow White and Sleeping Beauty and none of the um, lead characters looked like me and I remember the adults were doing a production that year and the um, leading um, lady uh, in the performance couldn't project loud enough so they had me in the very back sweeping a, with a broom and singing behind her so it sounded like her voice was stronger and I remember in my mind I like threw down the broom and marched off the stage and I said I'm gonna fix um, racism um, because I'm never gonna get the good parts um, and that led me in lots of cracks in my own worldview and so I did a lot of um, study about um, kind of global systems. I have a degree in international relations and kind of learned all the codes of what's wrong. And then that um, led me to study a lot of multicultural education. And while I was studying that and looking at systems, I was actually attending Prescott College at the time. And we always had to have a thread of an ecological thread and a um, social justice thread. And I happened to stumble upon a video about eco-psychology and on it, my um, now one of my dearest mentors, Carl Anthony was talking about, um, you know, why can all these environmentalists um, think about um, trees and mountains, but they can't think about people of color. And so it just put, and then the, eco-psychology piece, it just was a big aha to me to see that the oppression of people and the oppression of earth are always go hand in hand. And um, I can talk for hours about that and I've written about that. Uh, but I knew for me that um, with my own um, healing pathways and where I felt um, safe, you know, whatever safe means or calm was always in nature. And um, as I kept having more experiences in nature, yet I was looking at these different issues, it just all came together. And so I ended up doing a degree in cultural eco-psychology and I've just, eco-psychology is really um, one of my kind of, it's not only an academic area, it's a practice and worldview for me. Mm. Yeah. That was from Chelsea, by the way. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, and so Aaron Crow, how can nature connection practices help explore and consolidate identity in your opinion? Hmm. And gosh, that's an interesting question. So how can nature practices, Connection. connections, practices. explore and consolidate? And, well, I think um, what I was talking about before with the ecological self is, as we spend more time in nature and we start, uh, yeah, noticing and both, you know, in our sensual perceptual realms, but also learning about the ecology of a place, our bioregions, like even getting a little sciencey about it, um, we actually start realizing how alive every being is, um, not just you know, flying things and walking things and sw swimming things, but like all of nature, um, like plants have intelligence. Uh, you know, people are, you know, so into mushrooms and the underground kind of um, networks, you know, and there's just that everything is alive. And so we kind of start to shift of a way of like us being the viewer and taking in all this information to suddenly we realize that we're living in like this whole world where we're also being viewed and smelled and tasted and hunted. And um, we're, we're in this like very interconnected um, alive realm. And when we can, again, start quieting our egos, we might also start getting information that we never even noticed existed um, because all of life might start actually talking to us because we finally um, shut up a little bit. Like, oh my God, other, other things are alive and they also speak um, and feel and um, are deep allies and have wisdom that's beyond my capacity. 
And so I would say that will definitely expand our wisdom and self. And I would, I don't, um, the word, was it concretize or? Um, consolidate. Consolidate. Identity. I don't know. Identity. If, yeah. And I don't know if I, I guess consolidate for me would be more like ground and integrate. Uh, I don't think we'll ever be um, finally done. Um, the point is that we're always going to be shifting and expanding and changing, yet we'll start to find the core of who we are and also that ability to keep being perceptually open to all of these other beings and realities and knowing that um, what's other is also self. Um, and so, yeah, that's, um, that's yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is from Carol Clements. Ooh, Power. Hi, Carol. <laughs> hi, Carol. Powerful oh. narcissism as sociocultural state is the root also racialized trauma inflicted by white supremacist individuality to, quote, pursue freedom, acquiring wealth rather than equality that undergrids capitalist practices. Mm. Uh, we <laughs> so, yeah. So I think yeah. maybe I think she's I think she's naming like when because you were talking about the root of trauma in individual childhood yeah. experiences, and then yeah. when you extend to a collective, you're talking about the notion of, in ecopsych of original trauma, but also more recent traumas. And Carol's yeah. I think saying is racialized trauma inflicted by white supremacist individuality to quote pursue freedom like. Yeah. Uh, individuality means I can pursue freedom, but really I'm pursuing, uh, I'm acquiring wealth rather than uh, equality. And could yeah. this be part of what undergrids capitalist practices? I would say definitely. Um, maybe like, um, and I don't know if I'm uh, fully on um, addressing the question in the um, way Carol's asking it. Uh, but I think about when you were reading those qualities of a narcissist um, before and that, that transactional thing. And I was like, oh, you know, that person's a real jerk. Um, we could also look at kind of the archetype of um, um, white supremacy and whiteness and be like, oh, those people are such jerks. Um, but in heart, it goes back to you. Um, such a deep, deep, deep wounding of again, you know, 500 and something years. I think about um, there's many that write and document the witch burnings that happened in uh, Europe to indigenous, indigenous Europeans, aka pagans, aka small um, land based communities um, in Europe, and how those communities were terrorized in order to um, eradicate their pagan traditions, their earth-based traditions as keepers of the land and um, as a way of taking those lands and also forcing those populations away from working and having um, subsistence through their relationships to the land to being um, workers and um, consumers and how much violence had to happen in order to that. And then how then that um, pattern and violence then was evoked again through sending folks that had that damaged out into the world uh, through the process of colonization and then having contact with these other peoples and invoking that same violence that was put on to them to this and then um and we you know fast forward to 1700s and creation of whiteness and this um archetype and then fast forward to now and the archetype of um whiteness and if we go back to that ideal of this cocoon and um how scared people are to lose that privilege those you know, right now we're seeing such um, kind of racist backlash because people are deep down inside so scared of losing these perceived privileges that are really just perceived privileges because um, working class and poor whites do not have these privileges and they're often the people that are duped to support um, in the vote in other ways. Uh, 
to have them. And so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just permeates this idea of um, racialization with white communities. And, but at the root of it is this really, really deep pain, loss of identity, loss of connection to earth-based traditions. So I don't know if I, uh, but I, Carol, I know we're having tea soon, so we can talk more about it. <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll just read for everyone, but then we'll go to a different question. Carol responded that the sociocultural narcissism is the root of psychology, mm -hmm. uh, aligns with my thinking that psychotherapy counseling serves as a technology of oppression. And she's curious your thoughts. So we, you can pick yeah. those up at tea. <laughs> yeah, well, that um, is actually, what can I say one? Yeah, because yeah, eco-psychology is um, the roots of it is a radical critique against mainstream psychology which is so focused on the individual and so when we focus on individuals we're not looking at what's going on the globe and both in social justice and ecological issues but any issues and looking at the collective um but yeah yeah great so um, there are so many good questions, and I think what we'll do is I'll, I'll give you some more. And then before we end, though, I'll just read the questions that are left because so much is in the questions themselves. So one, is, this is from Bonnie Sundance. Hey, Bonnie. Please talk about the path. Please talk about the path to shift focus from meeting one's needs through career and consumerism into returning the self to nature and the greater good of care for Earth and people. Yeah. That's such a good question. And uh, that's one that I don't have the you know answer to because it's gonna look different for um, so many different um, peoples and communities. But I love that Bonnie, that you um, framed it as the path because there's so many things that we can do on the you know individual level um, in terms of nurturing our callings and divesting from certain systems and um, you know supporting other systems. Yeah, and then we can dip into what's there within the communities that we live in. But in order to make these radical, radical changes, we do need the support of collective um, systems, um, both on the nation and the global level. And so, so many of us, you know, feel like this incredible guilt because, like, no matter what I do, I'm still participating in the system. But we actually have to. Um, change the whole system. And um, that's not something that an individual or even just like a small group can actually do. And uh, I have a, my book before this one um, was called um, Globalism and Localization, Emergent Properties. I forget what it actually, what it, the full <laughs> title is, but it was a bunch of us writing about kind of this topic. And um, and I had a chapter in it called um, The Ties That Bind, an Earth-Based Story of Home. And one of the key pieces in it was really looking at how we need um, the majority of communities to be shifting, yet to be connected in a network. And we actually need the majority because if we're um, this like healthy eco-social community, but we're next to a dominated community, we're going to get dominated. And so we actually have to have the majority of the globe shifting. And so we need all of these changes from every level. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question. Okay. Um, was the industrial revolution the moment when we turned from focusing on character to personality popularity and this slippery slope to where we are now? Kimberly Richardson. Ah, I would, that's a great question. I think it's was one step in many steps. Um, yeah. And what was the word in terms of what we are now? What was that? Um, um, popularity and um, uh, personality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is actually a really good question. I would say, I would probably peg it more um, right post World War II uh, because all of a sudden there was a level of 
affluence and kind of this um, kind of follow through of this great new economy and also with the um, the um, housing um, allotments that came out of World War II where suddenly um, the suburbs were created because um, veterans, um, white veterans were um, able to um, buy homes and all of these so single family homes and then everyone needed a dishwasher and um, you know laundry facilities and all of these things and then status started to be such a huge thing so it was kind of opening that economic prosperity um, beyond just the kind of wealthy owning class and so that um, kind of unbridled self-importance of you know keeping up with the Joneses and then having these narrations of identity and having your kids go to the right schools and thinking that you're really successful um, just because you have more money and more access and all of these things. And then I would say, um, it's so funny because I'm like, yeah, when I was born, there was no internet, or I don't think there was. Um, we didn't have cell phones and, you know, but in my lifetime, uh, you know, my teen, it had all kind of blew up. And then um, I think that just added such a layer of that we can um, basically every day be creating our own documentaries of self. And um, I can spend all day just promoting myself, thinking good things about myself, doing, you know, transactional relations about myself. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a, a full on progression. And then, yeah, but great question. What are, what are some examples in your experience of touch points to bring people into a softer, self-loving, ecological space? And they say that it's anonymous, but I, I, I'm asking as someone working in the healthcare space. Yeah, um, there are so many. And um, my um, doctoral area is in transformative learning. And there's, and in psychology as well, there's just this, you just, need to meet people where they're at so their edge of awareness you want to go just beyond that edge of awareness so you know some people it would be like horrific to plop them in a wilderness immersion um like some people they just need to like go outside on a walk or um have a house plant or um a pet um there's just like so many different touch points um i think the uh, mindfulness and it doesn't mean they need to sit on a cushion and do a retreat but there's so many different forms of just getting in touch with center with breathing um, even just um, nutrition so many folks don't drink enough water and don't eat enough um, or have access to clean healthy food um, there's just so many little things and I think that um really having so many different forms of love that aren't dependent on one person or one like um, channel to try to meet all your needs for love. So whether there's love with sunlight, there's love with being um, in a service project or community, there's love with taking care of oneself, um, with taking a nap, with sitting outside. There's just, I think there's infinite touch points. And that's one of the um, pieces, Chalice Glendening, who I brought up before, talks about this primal matrix, um, which is the kind of the opposite of the original trauma, like what was our original state? And it has three different dimensions, but the last one is non-ordinary states of awareness. And these aren't things that you need to take psychedelics or go on a 40-day um, fast to do. They're like the most simple things. It's like having a cup of tea with the right amount of honey or uh, um, going outside or even being inside and hearing birdsong in the morning or catching a sh shooting star. I mean, that's not the most simple thing to catch, but um, you know, getting a hug from a loved one. There's so many different touch points. Thanks, Janine. So I'm just going to, because we're coming to a close here, I'm going to read what's left. And actually, a, a number of them relate to this last one that you spoke to. Mm -hmm. And 
so we can hear the wisdom in the in the unanswered questions. Um, Aaron Crow says, how can we respectfully resource nature and ourselves instead of relying on others to fulfill our needs? Peggy, um, uh, I'll come back to yours, Peggy. Um, <laughs> Hallie says, are there ways you envision people returning to nature on a large scale? such as social movements, shifts in the education system, advertising, et cetera. Mm. And uh, anonymous attendee, I've made a lot of extreme changes in my life to live more ecologically sound with our earth. I felt called to share parts of this with my life of my lifestyle with others, but don't want to come across as quote better than or preaching in any way. Wonder if you have any thoughts on how to share these experiences with others as a way to connect deeper with others and the natural world. Uh, powerful just to hear questions, right? Right. Uh, uh, Leona says, um, for people who care about that identity so strongly with their own ego, materialism, and consumerism, how do you nudge them toward finally waking up? Hmm. And um, uh, uh, Peggy uh, Ayers or Ayers says, how is narcissism a positive thing only to highlight the opposite? Thank you. Mm. And finally, um, Fawn Finley just came in and says, your book aligns with my experience in job seeking and entrepreneurship. What differentiates you? What makes you special? Why should we hire you? These common questions reinforce narcissism. How can business take the narcissism out of their hiring practices? How can entrepreneurs think beyond their immediate need for cash and success? These are all such great questions. Yeah, yeah I wish we had time to talk about each one. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the questions also you'll have to say now, Janina, as we close, yeah. is an anonymous attendee says, which department program do you teach in at Naropa? And then you could speak more to these things. Right. So you can sure. announce that? Sure. And I actually, my um, full-time job is at uh, CIIS and um, I teach in a PhD program, which many um, Naropa graduates have uh, enrolled in, um, which is great. And I, I used to be full-time at Naropa, but I do still teach one class. It's an undergraduate class called Deep Ecology and it's online, but every other week it's all about being in nature. And uh, it is, it's a question, that's a good question. What department am I housed in? Um, it is in the online um, BA contemplative psychology program, um, but it's also cross-listed, I think, in the environmental studies department. Okay, and someone just came in and said, great class in the chat. And there's okay. one, more, one more question from Anonymous to say, and then we will come to a close. And students, we have some announcements too. <laughs> yes, yeah, students today are interested in action, but many of these seem like Joanna Macy's holding actions. What steps do you see for people to regain a real sense of community and not participating in global capitalism? Yeah, uh, that's such an important question. And um, yeah, one of the things that I've been um, is, is we just have to participate in our actual communities. So we need to know who our neighbors are, um, both human and all of life neighbors. What are the um, like resources and capacities of the place we live? And we need to break out of um, these um, kind of uh, silos of, oh, I only talk to people with the same political beliefs as I, um, or spiritual beliefs. I don't um, go across the aisle. And I always laugh because with a lot of this kind of movement work, um, people keep trying to create these kind of global um, panels or think tanks. And they're always made up of these like sexy group of diverse people that look like really good. And it's like, you know, in my real neighborhood, um, we've got people of all different um, ages and abilities. And most of us aren't looking all sexy and, um, 
you go to the potluck and you have to sit next to the person who has a stinky tuna fish and you're going to get annoyed and blah, blah. Like we actually have to come to the ground of being of like, this is the real place that we are arising from what's here and how do we really attend? Um, so I think kind of coming to that sobering acceptance of what life really is, where we're, we're at. Mm. Okay, Janine, will you, before we uh, return ourselves into uh, our bodies and uh, our environment and each other through bowing at the end, will you just announce for us this um, uh, upcoming Earth Embodiment Workshop and Community Practice Day? Yeah, and I, I just really want to thank the Naropa community. Um, it's so beloved, and I just feel so honored to be hosted tonight. And I'm super excited that uh, the weekend of March, uh, from March 10th through 12th, it's a Friday evening, um, is a public talk that you can register, and it's open. Um, it's a standalone from 6 to 8 on March 10th, and then um, 9 to 3 on uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday, March 11th and 12th, my um, dear um, colleague and friend Erica Burland and I are doing a workshop for Naropa called Earth Embodiment, Eco-Psychology, Somatics, and Contemplative Practice. So uh, we'll definitely get into a lot of these things and just a lot of practice um, during that weekend. And then I'm so excited that I was asked to be the uh, you know, speaker at Community Practice Day on March, Tuesday, March 7th, and um, I'll actually be there in person. So if you're um, in the New Europa community, hopefully you'll um, come that day or um, attend the Zoom sessions as well. So you're going to yeah, give a, I, silent, a silent talk, right? During right? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And Jason, I really want to just um, thank you. You uh, um, yeah, you've been so supportive of my work and uh, you're one of my dearest friends and colleagues on this beautiful earth, within this beautiful earth. You as well. And thank you, Jacob, also, and the rest behind all of this. And so as we go in right now to close, um, I want to leave us with some very pithy, beautiful lines from your text. Oh. And let's come in to get ready to bow uh, to return if we use her title as a as a as a practice instruction to return ourself to the nature that is our bodies our environment that our bodies are in and with each other right now because we're not alone and so as we go to do this listen to these words and then let's bow she says her body was our first experience of life, our first ecosystem, our shared mother. Most of us would never treat our human mothers in this manner. Thank you.